Welcome once again to the Influencers Podcast. We are here to see the influence of your life grow. You have been equipped by your father to be a victor. Welcome to the Influencers Podcast. I'm Scott Young. Our co-host Dave Donaldson is out on assignment, but I really am excited about our conversation today because every once in a while you come across someone that is a has a message is a preacher a teacher a mentor that inspires you and brings change to your life and today's guest has done that in my life dr wayne cadero is the founding pastor of hope new hope international ministries which he and anna began in the mid 80s in hawaii this church helped to launch and see 153 additional churches start. He's the author of some 14 books with some more on the way. And uh, he's uh, been married almost 50 years, a dad of three, a granddad of nine. He left Hawaii in uh, 2017 to become the president of a college in Eugene, Oregon, uh, New Hope Christian College has a mission to develop messengers and a clear message for this rising generation. He speaks all over the world to help empower leaders and inspire. In fact, that's how I first met Dr. Cadero. He was speaking at my daughter's graduation here in Florida. And before he said anything, I just knew I needed to get to know this guy. His face radiated joy. So before he said anything, he was communicating. And then I walked away. He spoke, of course, wonderful message at the graduation. But I started reading his books and I started listening to him. And he's been an inspiration in my life. And I know if you'll listen, this is about being an influencer on this podcast. The influence of your life will grow as we share in this conversation with Pastor Wayne, Dr. Cadero, my brother. We are so glad that you're with us today. Thanks for joining us. Pastor, it's uh, that was the best introduction I've ever received. Man, there was there was only once before that there was a better introduction uh, when uh, there was no one to introduce me and I had to introduce myself. But other than that, you, yours is right at the top. My whole life was flashed before my eyes. <laughs> it's been a life, uh, Wayne, of of creativity. Um, it, books come out of you, uh, leadership ideas come out of you. When did you first know that you were a creative? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I had to, it was almost by desperation at first, Scott, because uh, I was a young pastor. They were paying me $500 a month to pioneer this church in Hawaii. They had no money. So I had to fend for myself. I was a wedding singer. I would sing at weddings. I I started writing because they were paying $50 an article uh, for a youth article on youth leadership. So I thought 50 bucks, I can use that. So I started writing. Little did I know that God was going to use that 14 books later uh, in, in, uh, in the field of ministry leadership. So it was almost out of necessity that I began to create content. Do you think creatives are are more susceptible to the highs of creativity and the lows, the dark nights of the soul that uh, you kind of write about in Leading on Empty? Yeah, you know, uh, I think there's higher highs and lower lows, and you have to navigate those currents well. Otherwise, it can capsize your boat. And uh, because if you're going to... Uh, love deeply, you're going to understand what pain uh, is and uh, hurt, uh, deep hurt is. You'll go both sides of the uh, spectrum. And in fact, I burnt out twice and uh, it was a, a terrible, terrible time from which came leading on empty. And then I went through cancer and then a heart attack. And so from all of that, you, you understand life f- far more deeply, and there's a passion burning in your soul that you want to sing about it, write about it, talk about it. In fact, you write in um, Leading on Empty that it wasn't until you began to see your depression as a constant reminder that you needed to stay close to God, that it was simply more than simply an annoying pain and it plagued your daily life, that your first step towards rehabilitation 
and to see your depression as a positive challenge that would draw you closer to Christ on a daily basis. How does depression draw people closer to God? You know, uh, Scott, it's not necessarily just depression per se, but it's the way I define depression. Uh, it's your life. It's my life. We can define stuff any way we want to define it. And it could be an adventure or an ordeal. It just depends on how you look at it. And I, I had to think about it because it would, it will kill you. It will ruin you. It will darken your future. It will cause you to live in the shadows. But I had to look at it in a way. Here's what I say. I, I think about stuff long enough, turning it, uh, marinating it. I think about it long enough until I get it to start working for me and not against me. And that's when I started to become more resilient and started to see the benefit in what God was teaching me. So if someone's listening today and they're going through a, uh, just a dark night of the soul, uh, what words of advice would you say if you came along beside them or you're sitting across a table having a coffee with them to just say, hey, here's some of the things I've learned? Yeah, the, the, th you'll, the only time you're going to lose is if you give up and become a victim. And I started slipping into that, Scott, where my mind, uh, I became a victim to it. And I thought uh, there was no hope. I couldn't get myself out of it. I couldn't bounce out of it. And uh, there was one night it got so dark, speaking of the dark night of the soul, I thought, you know, the only way to get out of this, because ministry expectations were on me, uh, publication deadlines, uh, it doesn't matter. You know, sort of like people don't care if you're not feeling good. You have to speak on Sunday. <laughs> it's just how it is. And uh, it comes around quite regularly these Sundays. And so it it's like, a, it doesn't matter. you got to you got to pull yourself together. And so I thought, I can't this time. I just can't do it. And it was almost like the devil himself said, the only way you can get out of this with a pass is if you die. And if you were dead, people will go, oh, man, he really worked hard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in the deepest and darkest night of my soul, Scott, for the very first time, it was like death was a greater gift than life because it gave me freedom. But as soon as I thought that, I thought the enemy's in the room. And that the room got very, very, very dark. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the only one that has experienced this. I've pastor friends that have actually uh, gone further than that. And some I know have lost their lives because of it. But I knew that was the enemy's tactic to, to somehow buoy death as better than life. And that's the only way to freedom. So I knew that I had to to win over that one. I had to win and get my mind back. And so I wrestled all night. Uh, I knew that joy cometh in the morning. So I, I wrestled. I took a walk. I prayed. I cried. I sang. But I would not give up. Do you find when you talk about it, and you've written this book um, that has helped a lot of leaders called Leading on Empty, do you find that because you talk about it so openly that people then open up to you and say, Wayne, let me let me tell you my story? Yeah, Scott, the, if, if someone is unable or unwilling to talk about something, that something owns him. Mm, that's good. You have to be able to articulate it, talk with someone. And my prayer and hope was that that book would allow people at least the courage and the transparency to talk about it, knowing that they're not the only ones that are frail. There's many leaders out there that are frail. And so we need help. We're not supermen. And once they get that through their hearts and their minds, uh, they're on their way to healing. I hope you heard what uh, Pastor Wayne just said. If you won't talk about it, if you keep hiding it, then that thing owns you. Great truth there. And and you've been long-term marriage, which I, I love. Um, um, my goal, long-term marriage. Um, how, how did Anna do when you were going through this this season? This You've had this, uh, look what I saw, you're radiating joy. If, if you look up Pastor Wayne and look for images of Pastor Wayne, he's going to have a smile on his face. Did you smile all the way through this journey? <laughs> 
I wish I could. Um, I, you know, I protected my wife as much as I could from it. Uh, because it's sort of like that, the, the reason the bo- the book is called Leading on Empty is because you're empty and they still expect you to lead. You have to show up, you have to smile, you have to tell a joke, you have to come across with, with something significant from the Bible every mm-hmm. Sunday. And uh, you, that's just how you got to do it. And And Leading on Empty was a period of my life where it was very painful, but I knew I had to protect my wife. I didn't want to pull her into it. I didn't want her to to slip into the vortex with me. I had to win that, and I needed to depend on Jesus. And it was almost like the Lord took away all my crutches, all anything that I would lean on. And as I often say, you know, sometimes you don't realize that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you got. And I came to that realization, and I figured I can do it. So I protected my wife as much as I could, but she knew I was going through something. She prayed a lot for me, and she was extremely understanding. And you said earlier that you cycled through this twice in your life. Did you miss something the first time, or was it just the same thing over again, deja vu all over again? Uh, You know, when your iPhone battery uh, goes dead or goes on the red, and you get a notice or notification that your battery is very low, uh, you can plug it in and charge it, and it turns green again when it's about 20-some percent. I charged up, and and, uh, I figured since my battery is green, uh, I'm good to go. But I was only 22% back, and I jumped back in, Scott, and I should have waited till I was 100%, and that was a mistake. Uh, I'm just too impatient sometimes, and I'm thinking, you know, I can I can jump in now. I feel good. And even though some friends said, Wayne, you need to just continue to rest, I almost felt guilty and said, no, I can't. They're paying me. I'm expected to. And I jumped back in. It wasn't more than a year, year and a half later that I, I got nailed again. What a great, great analogy with the the iPhone partially charging. I think everyone can identify with that. And there's people listening to us that we're always aware that there are people listening to us that are in a dark place right now, uh, trying to find hope. I think that uh, your ministry would be encouraging because you've walked this journey, but uh, make sure you're healed before you come back. I think that was the key lesson from that. And then you go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I, I tell people, you know, when they said, are you doing better? I said the right word, Scott. I said, you know, I'm out of the forest, but I still feel the bark of the trees on my back. And uh, I was just that much out of the forest, just an inch or two. But it's, I wish I would have been more patient and, and just rested a little bit more. But it's hard for a leader that's kind of an alpha dog to, to sit back. I was raised by a father who was in the army. He was a master sergeant and um, he made us feel guilty if we took a break because it was work. You know, you, you, you need to discipline yourself. And, uh, I think that was something in woven into the fabric of hardwired into me that I had to, to unlearn. Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock and a few others, he's a futurist. He said something profound. Uh, he, he said, uh, the literate of the 21st century will not be those who can read or write. The literate of the 21st century will be those who can learn, unlearn, and relearn. And I had to unlearn some things, Scott, which I was tardy in doing. And it was a weight about my feet that tripped me up. Did, did people help you to learn? Like, who are the voices that sort of said, hey, maybe your dad has something to do with this? You know, they didn't say that, but they did say, Wayne, you know, take it easy, rest, uh, slow down. But that's hard when someone, you know, if you're like an alpha dog and they say, you got to slow down, Scott. So you say, thank you so much. And you're cordial. <laughs> but then you put on your boots and you go for it. Uh, sometimes those things you just almost have to learn by consequences and then uh, it sinks deep into your souls. So now I tell people I cannot burn out again. I, I cannot. Otherwise I'm out. So I will not burn out. So even if I start to feel 
uh, weary in my spirit or fatigued in my soul, uh, I, I, I leave. And so there's times I will have a meeting at three in the afternoon, but at one o'clock I am fatigued. I will ask my assistant, would you be so kind as to reschedule that? I can't do it. I never used to do that before. I do that now. You know your boundaries a little more. Yeah. You've, you've grown, you've, you've unlearned and you've relearned. Yeah. Now, your life has mentored so many people and um, from your reading, from your, your speaking, from your educational process. We'll talk about that in a minute. But who have been the people that have mentored you? Who are, who are your heroes? You know, Scott, it's interesting. Uh, God uses saints and scoundrels both to through which he uh, gives lessons. And, and the, first of all, my best friends are in the Bible. Uh, every problem that you or I will ever go through will have already been experienced by someone in the Bible. And they leave breadcrumbs, as it were, behind them so that those who would take the time to read their stories will be able to uh, have a GPS that they themselves have formulated for you. As Romans says, you know, these things that were written er in earlier times are written uh, for our benefit upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So they were actually written for you and me, and we need to give them audience. So the first, my divine mentors uh, are in the word of God. Um, David, Moses, Samson, Solomon, all of these that I often uh, sit with inquiry and ask, you know, Solomon, how can you be so wise in the beginning and foolish in the end? And, Moses, what do you do when people complain and criticize and cynicize? Uh, you know, you went through it and you didn't fare well right at the end. You got angry and I learned from them. But, you know, the funny thing is I've learned so much from uh, I used to go over to Chicago and spend a few days with Bill Hybels uh, before all of the stuff came out. And even though his life may not uh, have a sheen to it. I mean, he may not have finished as well as some thought. I learned a ton from it. Mm. And uh, I thank God for that. Uh, others as well. But uh, Bill was a <coughs> big one. There's some elders in our church that have been profound friends to me. Uh, one just passed away and I miss him dearly. But uh, an elderly man, 10, 11 years my senior, that uh, had my best at heart and would always watch out for my health. Not my ministry performance and not my fruitfulness. That was nice, but it was my health. And I so appreciate that till this day. I think it's great you mentioned the biblical mentors as well as um, some physical mentors. But the, the, there's a book, and uh, Wayne did mention it, uh, Divine Mentors, which is a great book to learn that the Word of God is not a dusty book that should sit on your shelf. But these are people you live with and learn from. And I loved when I read that book and it meant a lot to me. You, you've also had to build great teams around you in um, Hawaii, great church leaders, and now you're building great academic team and church team. We'll talk about that. When you're building a leadership team, what qualities are you looking for in the people you want close to you? You know, of course, you're going to look for character and uh, depth. Uh, of character. You're going to look for cap capacity and competency. But, uh, you know, you know, Scott, I start to, over the years, what's most important to me is I like, I want to know how they think. What's going on inside? How do they think about a problem? How do they think about the church? How do they think about the harvest? And uh, I learn a lot about people by the way they think, because there's going to be days where there's no supervision, no one calling the shots. They've got to figure it out themselves. And if their thinking is wise and it's good and it's solid and biblical, uh, I like that. The second thing is I want to know their their commitment to and their consistency with the word of God. That is our GPS. That's our guidebook. It's not business books. It's it's not good to grade as wonderful as they are or best practices. It's the word of God, because in these last days, we need divine wisdom. As it was said of the uh, sons of Issachar in Chronicles, it said they understood the times and knew what Israel should do. 
People today aren't looking for an echo of themselves wrapped in spiritual clothes. They're looking for what does God think? And deep inside, that's exactly what they want to know. Although on the surface, they might battle with that and they might refute it. But on the inside, when all of the the uh, noise has quelled and all of the, the people have quit talking and they're by themselves, down deep inside, they want to know. God made them that way. And uh, that's how we were designed and to know God. So that's what they want to know, whether they fight you at that moment or not. When it's all quiet on the Western Front, they want to know what God is saying. And Pastor Wayne has developed um, a four-step process just to encourage people to spend time in the world called in the Word called soap. Uh, look at the scriptures, observe the scriptures, apply the scriptures, and pray the scriptures. Is that original to you? Because I know people are using that around the world. And w when did that idea just hit your your mind to take those four concepts? <laughs> you know, it was actually by accident, Scott, some 35 years ago. Uh, I was doing, I was just simply taking a notebook and setting it up on my own with a pen and I would write the scripture. And hermeneutically, you need to have observation. You can't go from scripture to application. That's how you build cults. So you've got to have context. To whom was he speaking? Why was he speaking to them? Uh, what was going on? And so I would make an observation. And then from that, now you can accurately apply. And then I would write my prayer. And I was doing that and uh, teaching some pastors how to do it and set up a, a little journal or notebook. And one of the pastors just said, hey, it, that that spells soap. It's an acrostic, S-O-A-P. And I said, that's good. Let's use that. And so it was really by accident that it came about that it just organically appeared. And so it became what's known as soap today. It's an idea that has blessed thousands and thousands of people. And I encourage you to learn how to take that approach to spend time in the Word as a Pastor Wayne has said that's going to make all the difference in the way you think and the way you approach life. Tell us a little bit of what you're doing now. New Hope West that you're engaged in, uh, New Hope Christian College. What is holding your passion now? You know, uh, it was my alma mater and that uh, they were going to shut down. It's a small private Bible college. And if you don't have a large denomination or huge endowment, it's pretty tough to have a strictly Bible college where you're training people primarily for ministry. And uh, some, of course, will go into the marketplace. We have fashion designers, policemen, EMTs, all kinds, but primarily the emphasis is for the bride of Christ. And so that's a Bible. It's not a liberal arts, uh, a Christian liberal arts college. It's a Bible college. Everyone majors in Bible with concentrations in business or counseling or youth or, but basically it's for the church. Uh, I tell people Microsoft doesn't really need our help. Neither does Google or Apple, but the bride of Christ really does. And we want to put out exemplary leaders that have a competency and a huge heart for the harvest. And we want to train and disciple them. And so uh, when I heard that our, our Bible college was going down, I was in Hawaii. And so I started traveling back and forth to try and help. and. Uh, then there was a kind of a split in the church back in Hawaii. So I had to go back and uh, stay with that for four years. And then the, the college kind of lost it, its emphasis. And then they called me again four years later and said, uh, we're going to bankrupt the place again. We're shutting it down. At that point, I thought I need to decentralize our church because it was very large at that time. And so we decentralized the church into 22 new hopes, Scott. Mm -hmm. And so in Honolulu now, we have 22 new hopes in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we passed batons. And when I went back to the Bible college, uh, it wasn't uh, adequate to train people in the classroom alone. I knew that there had to be a lab church. And that started when I was, I had a heart attack and I was having heart surgery and, and they flew me to Stanford Medical Center. And before I went in on the gurney, Scott, they said, would you sign this permission slip? I said, permission slip? What do you mean permission slip? Uh, so students can come into the surgery room. 
and be a part of the surgery. And I thought, no way are they touching my heart. And it said, no, no, the, the cardiac surgeon, the chief surgeon will be, be doing it. But uh, the students, we want them there to watch. I said, absolutely. So when it was done, I thought, if we have a Bible college, God, we should have a lab so that they too can find out how to put their hand to the plow instead of just to the pencil or pen or computer. And so right in the middle of COVID, I just felt the Lord say, then you plant a lab church for these students so that if they're studying children, they actually are in the children's ministry. If they're studying creative arts, they're doing the creative arts. And so we planted this pioneer church called New Hope West. So now it's called New Hope Church in College. And the students run all the broadcast equipment, all the LED screens, all of the television cameras. They do the music, children. Of course, we have veterans that oversee them and teach, but they, they do the grunt. They're there. They're setting up. They're taking down. They're washing, cleaning. And when each student graduates, he or she will have, have accumulated 14 to 1500 hours of practicum. And that's what we're doing now. And it has my heart and it has my passion. So I love that. I love a couple of things. One is I think American needs, um, uh, I'm pr we pray for revival, but we need Bible colleges across America. So thank you for helping this college to stay vibrant because we're praying for revival. And if God does bring in millions of new souls, we need leaders. We need a strategy behind the prayer. So I'm looking to put my energy and help people like your vision to just say, that's what we need across America. And then the school that my wife and I went to, my, my president of the college that we went to was the pastor of the church. And it was mm. very much that we worked in the church. There were no LED screens. <laughs> there was, none of there was cassette in the street. We put cassettes in duplicate. <laughs> it's all new, but the principles are the same. That, that I just love what you are, what you're doing there. And yes, uh, the over overhead projectors. Yeah. <laughs> this is when we planted this church uh, 28 years ago. No lighting system for our first presentation. I cut a circle in a hole of paper taped it to the overhead projector, and I was the lighting director. Whoever was speaking, I pointed the overhead at them. That was our lighting system. Yeah. So, you, now, you, you've got a new project. You've got 14 books under, but there's something coming out of you now. So talk a little bit about what that creative creative heart and what's, what's coming out of your soul now. Well, I have uh, actually three books in the hopper. The first that uh, will be completed soon is called Vindicating Virtue. Uh, I think we have lost virtue in our dealings in leadership. And so they have methods now. They have best practices. But underneath, virtue is missing. And, and how Jesus says in Matthew 15, it's out of the heart that comes evil thoughts and hurts and fornication and adulteries and slanders and greed. If our hearts remain the same, it doesn't matter how cool our business is, uh, it, it will not be honoring to God. And so in the end, it's what honors God. So Vindicating Virtue is the first, and it's more of an academic book. Uh, but the other two, the next one is uh, coming out of David's 30 Mighty Men. It's called The Ambidextrous Leader, uh, how the sons of Benjamin uh, could sling stones with their left hand as well as their right, swing swords with their left hand as well as their right, throw javelins with both. And all it said is basically that they were very difficult to defeat because they were not one-dimensional leaders. They were multi-dimensional leaders. And so we want to talk about developing both sides of your brain, the right hand side and the left hand, and, and to make sure that there's not a blot, as First Timothy 3 says, a weakness in your life that you haven't attended to that becomes a breach in the wall. We must be hard to defeat in these last days. And then the final book uh, is uh, simply called uh, Letters from Death Row. Uh, it's uh, just out of the um, prison epistles when Paul the apostle knew he was going to die. He knew he was going uh, to uh, face his end. Uh, and if you are facing your last days, you're not going to talk about petty things. You're going to talk about profoundly important things. 
And so I'm going to extract the leadership principles out of his prison epistles as uh, laws for the leaders in these last days. So it's just called letters uh, from death row. And are you writing all three at the same? What is your process? Three books? How do you do that? I don't. I have uh, files, however, Scott, that I put when an idea comes, whether it's doing my devotions in the morning, I'll get an idea about, you know, a book. I will write it down and file it in that file. Or if it's one on the ambidextrous leader, you know, the sons of Issachar, or David's 30 mighty men, uh, I'll throw that in there and then leave it. But I'll be working on vindicating virtue. So I get away, take my computer, and I work uh, on uh, focusing on vindicating virtue. But if in the midst of it, I get an idea, I'll write it down and throw it in that file. So the next one that I'll be writing is called The Ambidextrous Leader. Now, I'll have a whole bunch of notes on that that I will have garnered along the way. And it makes the writing a lot faster. And then I'll work on the third book. So it's more in sequence, but in parallel are ideas that I ar- that I archive. Yeah, when you read Wayne Kadera, you'll find these quotes ideas that are rich. It's like mining um, his books and uh, which means you are a reader. And if we looked around to what you are reading today, what's high on your reading list right now? You know, I'll read both sides of the aisle. Uh, I'll I'll read some things uh, by Christian writers and then I'll read some things by secular writers. Uh, so right now I'm reading stuff on essentializing your life. Uh, it's not paring it down, but it's called essentializing. And then one called Atomic Habits, where it's a small changes in your life that add up to big things. And uh, the uh, five dying w- uh, words of dying people. Uh, I'll, I'll just read on the secular side to see what's going on on that side of the aisle. But I'll, I'll read... Um, I'll, I'll read those that are thinkers, uh, people that are good thinkers in the secular. I won't, I hardly read fiction and some, although I should, I guess I should, but I read, um, thought leaders in the secular side. And then I'll, I'll read things on the other side, the Christian side too, the, cause I've got to read theology because I teach in the college, et cetera. And and Sundays come around so frequently, so you are always producing material every <laughs> week for these books. So I can see why you don't spend a long time in fiction, because you don't live in that world. Too much. You live in a real world. And, you saw, yeah. and if you read Pastor Wayne and listen to his teaching, it's immensely practical, which is even in his devotion. There's an application. Here are these thoughts. Here's this theology. How do we work it out? You can see just even how the college is connected to a practical ministry, which is one of the things we love about you. And we so appreciate you taking time to be with us. And let me just ask this, and then I'll ask you to pray for our friends, if you would. Uh, What would be something that you wish you would have known way back in the beginning days, mid 80s, that, man, if I would have known that earlier, that would have really helped me get farther faster? You know, there's there's a there's a multiplicity of lost lessons. I tell people that we're often poorer because of the opportunities we have missed. And I wish I would have learned uh, how to connect with people earlier on, Scott. Uh, Connections are incredibly important, but I thought that was more of a pastime. I really didn't need to connect with people. I thought it was brown nosing. I thought it was, you know, just trying to be around um, influential people. But today, Scott, I'm realizing that those influencers, those leaders are people I should have chosen and not I make sure, you know, scrub my heart. I've got to make sure that my heart scrub, my motives are right. But uh, it's, it's sort of like Jesus, Scott. He, he didn't end up with 12. He chose 12. Mm-hmm. And I I wish I would have earlier on found individual names and said, I need to connect with these men and women and uh, made a beeline and asked them, can I come and spend a day or two? And I did that with a few. 
Uh, Bill Hybels is one, a few others who are so gracious to say yes. And I'd fly out there. It was worth the plane fare and three days lodging and food to just go and hang out with these people. And I wish I would have done that more. I think I would have a more circumspect view of not only theology, but ministry as well. And, and because in the end, all we got, Scott, are relationships. Everything else is going to burn. All we have are relationships. And I wish I would have spent more time emphasizing that earlier on. Well, we're taking to heaven with us, our friends and our relationships. So let me, you're, you're a, a, of course, a, a college president, but you're a pastor as well. And we, if you could just say a blessing. I, I, there's some people we've talked to today that are in a dark night of the soul. There are some people today that are saying, I'm trying to find meaning in life. And I, I wish I was could find application. I, I need to do my devotions more. They've been like encouraged on that. So many things we've talked about. Just can you bless us, Pastor? And uh, thanks for spending time with us. You bet. I'd be happy to. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, when you went through Gethsemane, it wasn't something that you could sidestep. You put your face like a flint to Jerusalem. And you went through Gethsemane. And even though your fleshly part said, Lord, if there be any way to remove this cup from me, please do it. But nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, the flesh part of us would like to bail out, find a side door and scoot. But on the inside, we know that you're the keeper of our hearts. You're the one that will walk us through the valley of the shadow of death. And some of us are in that valley of the shadow of death. But yet you will walk with us, for we will fear no evil, for thou art with us. And even through the flames, God, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you, you didn't make them immune from the furnace. You were in attendance with them as they walk through the furnace. And that's what gave them strength and courage. And that's what gave the world the testimony of these three Hebrew children. And so, Lord, we're not praying that we circumvent these things, but we do pray that you will give us a stronger uh, knowledge and recognition of the power of your presence, you will ne never let go of our hand. You will never do that. And Lord, even though we go through the tough valleys, you will be there with us because on the other side, there's something of a, of a deeper life that will have replaced that forlorn feeling that we had because you would never take us through a valley wherein you will not give us something of equal or greater value in return. So, Lord, we trust you. We don't always see the pathway, but we'll keep our eyes on you and who we're walking with, not on what we're walking through. So we thank you, Father, for being the great shepherd. We will be faithful sheep. How we love you. Thank you for loving us. Now, would you, Lord, uh, anoint and bless those who are in the in hearing of this uh, time with uh, Scott and myself, I pray that the lessons that they mm -hmm. would become, not education, but revelation. Mm -hmm. Because, Father, we can forget Christian education, but we cannot ever forget revelation. It's woven into the fabric of our souls. So would you do that, Lord? Turn these words into Holy Ghost revelation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as the old preacher said, let everybody say amen. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Wayne, for joining us and being a part of the Influencers Podcast. And to all of our friends that have listened today, thanks for shining brightly in a dark world. We want to see the influence of your life grow to bring hope to the hopeless, light into dark corners, and make a difference in the world you live in. Keep walking with Jesus every day for the Influencers Podcast. I'm Scott Young. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Influencers Podcast on the Charisma Podcast Network. If you enjoy our content, we would love for you to subscribe and have the opportunity to tune in to future podcasts. You can follow us on all social media platforms at the Influencers Podcast Official. 
You can stay up to date, hear more inspiring content, and unlock your full potential as an influencer. Remember to use your influence to create lasting change that draws the world closer to Jesus. Jesus.